Now, British tanks in the Russian Civil War. Now, very important here, the Russian Civil War is quite complicated. It lasts from 1917 to 1922, from whatever you take. And there was a lot of going on. You had external interventions like the British, and you had like other powers, like former parts of the Russian Empire that was fighting like the Polish and others. And you had internally the white Russians, as they usually called the white forces, which were also not completely unified, which were former generals, officers of the Tsarist regime, first the Reds, which were Bolsheviks and all the others. So extremely complicated conflict. I won't touch this here because, well, it's, it's not really what I want to talk about right now. And it's extremely complicated. So there was a lot of going on. And one aspect was that the British provided tanks for the white forces. In general, the British sent three tank detachments, which consi consisted of volunteers. They sent one to South Russia, one to Reval, and one to Archangel. Now, in July 1919, they sent around 57 Mark V tanks and 17 Whippet tanks. So the Mark V is the big regular tank you know, and the Whippet is a faster, more simpler tank. And if you put this in perspective, the Germans in total built around 20 A7 Vs, so their tank. So they were provided with more than three times the amount of tanks the Germans produced in the whole First World War on their own major tanks. So, and the Soviet Encyclopedia notes in total around 130 Allied tanks were sent. And the force was about 13 officers, 50 NCOs, and 105 other ranks. So they also had trucks, motorcycles, and officially they were there for maintenance and advice. Which I guess is the standard aspect. You always advise and do maintenance, you never fight. Additionally, some Russian officers were trained at Bovington, you know, the major tank school, and were nowadays the tank museum is. And they were trained in the use of tanks and also in the maintenance. It's a very important aspect in the First World War and also in the Second World War. Usually tank crews were also trained in maintenance. So, for instance, usually the driver was also the main mechanic of a tank in the Second World War. Even. And for the First World War, the breakdown, the reliability and everything was, of course, way worse than in the Second World War. There was also a central workshop and a tank stool established at Tangerok that was real near Rostov am Don. Now, one major use of the tanks by the Whites was in 1919, in May, by the vosko krinisenki shirovki area which I completely pronounced wrong, I guess. And at this point, the Reds abandoned their position. Now, it's very important the the Tsarist forces didn't have their own tanks. And what's generally a main issue with the tanks is their first appearance has a huge psychological effect and most people just give up because they don't know how to deal with this. I mean, you shoot at it and your bullet just goes away. So often you need to train your infantry, you need to tell them, okay, you need to wait for the artillery to take care of them, or you can do this and this. But this was generally not there. Now, of course, the Whites also used some tanks wrongly. And for instance, they used quite some tanks a lot of times on patrols regularly. This is not a good way to use a tank, especially not a first World War tank, because they are not really reliable. The material is not particularly strong. So a lot of wear and tear and these, basically these, tanks degraded and they couldn't be made operational anymore to a limited degree operational and they would break down sooner. So this is not what they do. So not the best way. Then another aspect was during the retreat at the Tagarok, where the major tank school was, the evacuation failed. There were some aspects which are not really explained well or is not unknown. And they lost about 25 tanks. So they lost about 25 tanks. So they lost more tanks than the Germans produced during the First World War on their own. And they also lost 50 tons of supplies and around 15 trucks. So whatever happened there, it was not particularly effective. Now for the Reval area, there were only a few tanks supplied, around six, and they had a great moral effect. The problem is, similar to the patrols, they put them on constant use. So the and constant demand, there was a lot of strain on the tanks and also on the crew. Because back then, um, the exhaust fumes and everything, they sometimes didn't circulate too well. So 
you had the crew poisoned on a engine fumes and everything. So basically after two months, all the tanks were out of action, couldn't be used anymore because they were used way too often. Again, similar problem, no, no knowledge of the limit of technology and on how to use it best. And then this happens. Now for Archangel, the situation was different. Here they were brought in to cover the British evacuation of their own forces. There were four tanks. And if you look at the area there, it was completely unsuited. You had swamps, you had rivers and very dense forests, but it's different than morale of the troops there because also the British troops that were sent there didn't see very much tanks before. Now of these tanks, two were left behind and they formed the core for a new tank school there. Now next, let's look at the Reds' use of the tanks. So the first tanks they had were basically trophy tanks. They took them from the Allies, from the French and the British. Because also the French also sent their tanks, for instance, the FT-17, to Russia as interventional forces. Now, as mentioned before, there was no serious production of tanks in Tsarist Russia. And so they used mainly captured tanks. And in total, they noted about 83 captured tanks, which is quite a lot if you look at the amount of tanks that were originally sent there. Now the main tanks were used were the FT-17, the Mark V and the Whippet. And also they produced their own tank. In August 1920, the first Soviet tank, the M-17, which was to a certain degree a copy of the FT-17, was produced. And it was quite an accomplishment considering the state of the industry and everything. And the Reds make good use of the tanks and from May 1920 to October 1922 they created 11 motor tank units, which consist of about 80 to 130 men, 3 to 4 tanks, 1 to 2 guns and 12 to 28 machine guns. So quite a lot of firepower if you consider this, because this is more firepower than a 1914 infantry division usually had in terms of machine guns. And at the armored forces in total, which also included the armored trains and the armored cars and motorized infantry, had around 29,000 men. So quite a substantial number. Now what was the first battle the Reds used tanks? Usually the Battle of Siyapki is noted in July 1920, but actually in the defense of no Novo Moskovsk in June 1990 the first use was. But the Battle of Siab Key is seen as the birth because it was the first planned use of tank. And they attacked a strong enemy position and they were able to dislodge the enemy from there. They were using combined arms warfare basically. They had an armored train, they had armored cars, infantry, cavalry and artillery. And the commander of the train and planner of this was also one of the creators of the later doctrine of deep battle. So very important what happened there. And another major aspect was the Battle of Kavkovka in October 1920. In this case, it was a defense against white tanks. So the white forces attacked with tanks, but the red had systematic anti-tank defenses. They had trenches that barbed wire and they had anti-tank ditches. And basically what they did, they let the tanks pass through and then attacked the following infantry. And the artillery took care of the tanks. So what they achieved at this point is that they trained the troops long enough and well enough that they didn't fear the tanks too much and could let them pass through and then let the artillery take care of them. So this was also a very important battle to see, okay, our troops are now well disciplined enough and knowledgeable enough to deal with an enemy tank attack and that the tank lost the, lost the psychological impact. They still had the armor and the firepower but the psychological impact was gone and of course since the tank has a very decreased amount of visibility it's rather vulnerable or it will miss infantry in trenches or something. Now very important here to mention the tank had not a decisive impact on the Russian civil war. Yet it had wide reaching influences in many other aspects we need to consider. First of all the propaganda aspect. Since there were no tanks produced within Russia it was clearly shown that enemy forces or outside forces, whatever you want to call them, were intervening in Russian affairs. Additionally, it provided a moral boost if one of these tanks was captured, 
and generally the percent of a tank on both sides resulted in a more boost for their troops and also for the civilians in the area occupied. Another aspect is that these tanks were the base for Soviet tank development. So they were the basic because now they had something to build the tanks upon since they had none originally. They had now proven in serious production elements that could be used. The, uh, the Tsarist regime also built some tanks but not in serious. So they also became the basis for Soviet tank, tank doctrine. And in September 1920, they already produced the first instruction for the use of tanks. Another important aspect is, if you look at the, at the rather harsh conditions, you have Archangel very up in the north. And these tanks were, to a certain degree, functional and operational in these areas. So this also shows, okay, if these tanks also work in the hard Russian climate under these conditions, this is a weapon we can use in the future. Another major important psychological aspect was that these tanks showed the backwardness of the Russian industry and the development of machines. So this came as a major shock initially. And at the same time, you had the interventionist forces showing up with this basically high technology and that they felt under siege from, from outside forces. And this is seen as one of the reasons why they put up a lot of memorials with these tanks. Because they show, okay, we defeated the interventionists. And we defeated their machines. And, and this also was basically also a wake-up call. And likely was one of the reasons why at the beginning of the Second World War against the Soviet Union in summer 1941, that the Red Army had one of the largest tank parts and they actually built them up way earlier. So at that, this point, a majority of the tanks were already too old again because they were preparing from the very get-go against a major armored force or have their own armored force. So as limited the impact of these tanks was on the battles of the Russian Civil War, as important were they probably for the development of the Red Army and for the second world. A big thank you here to Jack for sending me the book Genesis Employment and Aftermath of First World War Tanks. It helped a lot with this video. Thank you to all my patrons. Thank you for watching and see you next time.